freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 236 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. And we have a great show today. The theme is this just in. <laughs> Our guest today is Rob Morris. Rob is a host of the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast and co-host of the Polite Society podcast. He blogs at his Slow Facts blog and his articles appear in Ammo Land and The Clash Daily. Welcome to the show, Rob. It's great to see you again. I'm sorry it's not in person. Plans change. Welcome to COVID. No yes. doubt about it. I'm telling you. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, this week also to um, Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation about the Gun Rights Policy Conference. That is another one of our very important gatherings um, that has, you know, been canceled. Well, not canceled. They're going to switch it up a little bit. And we're going to talk about that later in the week when we have Alan on. But I'm telling you, our... It is, not only is it uh, lonely, <laughs> right? Like we miss our friends, but it- but you do have me, Cheryl. We do, yes. I do have Dan, oh. the other guy. <laughs> Dan, the other guy. Um, but it, I think that it's harder for us to kind of keep that network going, kind of keep that momentum going. And so when, when we have people like you that are pumping out articles, important articles about what's going on out there, uh, I think you write 10 a day. That's always my line because I feel like you write 10 a day. Um, I, we appreciate that and we want to dive into that today. Let's jump in. Awesome. I love it. So you most recent, uh, well, actually you've probably have written three while we've been doing your intro, but um, there was one that you wrote called Your Rights Come Before Politics. I mean, that's that is a mind-blowing concept these days. Like, how, how is that even possible that we still even have any rights? Because it feels like all we have is politics. You, right. Too close. And our, our mutual friend, Amanda Suffolk, called me up and said, Rob, we have a problem here in Ohio. We have it across the country. But she was putting on a firearms training class. By the way, thank you to all the new gun owners who are taking instruction. All my... Uh, Firearms instructor friends have been saying, oh, man, I hope they will finally come in. And we have to be careful what we wish for. Um, <laughs> and now she's hearing in her northeast part of Ohio, yeah, you can apply, but you need to get fingerprints. You need to make an application to get a carry permit. And, of course, the law says we have to respond promptly to that because it's an inalienable human right but we'll delay your application for six months. So we stay within the letter of the law. That's immoral. That's unconscionable. That's not what the legislature intended. That's not what citizens voted for. Yeah. And it's you happening. Know, that is so true. And then, you know, when we want to come to the letter of the law, well, where does that leave what's written in this document, our constitution right. and our bill of rights, because inside the Bill of Rights, which is that firewall. It was written to be a firewall between the politicians and personal lives. And the Bill of Rights includes the Second Amendment, which is our the, the written down version of our right to keep and bear arms. Our rights come from our creator, not from this document. But 
it's the only place, the Second Amendment, where our founders added this kind of gun rights for dummies clause, this you can't screw this up even if you try phrase that says shall not be infringed. So letter of the law, you know, that should be the letter of the law. And when you have to go through all of these hoops and these jumps and these delays, how, how do we let them, who's them, right? How do right. we let them infringe on the thing that our founder said, no, absolutely not. You cannot come even up to this line, much less jumping much over, less it. over it. And here's, you've touched on something really important. When a judge looks at a piece of legislation and asks, is it going over the line or could it go over the line? They ask themselves, they look for so-called legislative intent. Here's what the legislator said they were doing. Ah, but how can that same language be misused and abused and still remain within the law? Often judges don't ask that question. I was introduced to politics in Chicago. So I oh was brought up learning <laughs> oh that question. Um, right. Uh, if you, let's, let's state it another way. Legislators are given the benefit of the doubt. Citizens are not. Mm. Rob, there's some hope. Okay. So yes. Ever since this COVID happened, there has been millions of new gun owners. And some of these gun owners were some of the people that agreed with these laws that we have on our books right now. Before. Yep. Before. And now <laughs> they understand, oh my gosh, I didn't mean it to mean that. I didn't expect that it was going to affect me. So guess what they're going to be doing in November? Now we just, we just had a record class at our, at our uh, AZ Firearms uh, yesterday, Saturday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are brand new people that are just learning to shoot and learning to protect themselves and learning that they have rights. A training class. They are going to be at the polls in November. I think we're going to see a difference. I hope. The National Shooting Sports Federation just conducted a poll where they said, did you buy a gun recently? Was this your first firearm? What do you think of gun laws? How have you seen them uh, affect you in practice? What do you think should happen next? And in the, I think they chose the 18 battleground states for federal offices. And yeah, new gun owners there have, have learned a lesson. And they've said, no, I, more of the same is the wrong way to go. I think we should apply the laws we have. And I think if anything, further infringements on the right to keep and bear will make crime more likely rather than actually stop criminals from using a firearm. So that's, um, you're not only right with what you've seen, Dan, we're seeing it all across the country. Right. It's great. It's, well, it's a new hope. It, it is. And I do hope that people can keep that in the forefront of their mind as they are approaching the, the voting season and the voting booth. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to highlight in your article, Your Rights Become, Come Before Politics, um, that you wrote on July 19th at 2020, available at um, Slow Facts blog, is the idea towards the end that you say that when they uh, come at us one at a time, it's hard for anything to to change because one single person right right can be just kind of crushed under the weight of what's happening they can be sort of discredited and it's like oh well maybe they were a little bit off track anyway but if we all could get a collective mindset and understand that together again the vote right? Reaching out and talking to our, could you imagine talking to your elected representatives and let them know how you want to be represented? What an amazing and weird idea, right? But Upon which our country is founded, right? <laughs> thank you. Well, right? um, you can imagine uh, someone, uh, we'll go back to Northeast Ohio. I've seen threats in the area. People say they want to bring uh, violence to the suburbs and burn down homes. I feel insecure with my family. I'd like to protect them at home and as we travel. And you're saying I can't even apply for the government permission slip to do that for six months. Wow, I feel violated. 
And who would this individual talk to to find out he's not alone, that there are tens of thousands of people similarly situated in his county, a local NRA chapter, a local gun shop, a, a statewide organization that has regional chapters. Yeah, that's where you have to start. Maybe you have to get political quickly and say, okay, which party is going to support my rights, is going to help me organize locally, can help gun... You remember in Virginia, there were massive protests county by county. And what did they come up? Over 104 sanctuary cities in Virginia when the legislature flipped to the party that wants to impose gun control? Maybe that's what needs to happen in Ohio. Well, I don't disagree with you, but Virginia, I think, is such uh, a perfect kind of microcosm to look at. So right. Virginia used to be one of the most freedom-loving states. And now when you look at, you know, the, the hundred some sanctuary cities and the people that showed up to have a, a peaceful but open carry um, protest uh, in January of 2020 at their, their state legislature, it, it seems like that spirit is still there. But in between, what happened? People right. fell asleep at the wheel and voted in people that exert power over them. And so now we are again reacting right. and saying, wait a minute, you can't take our rights. And wait a minute, we should recall this person, Judd, uh, what's his name, Northam, um, right. uh, all that. Why don't we, here's another crazy idea, why don't we be proactive? And as we are, again, in an election season, how about we walk into the booth already knowing who is going to live out their oath that they take to protect and defend the Constitution? Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. News bulletin. The problem is that I think, and I, I'm starting to get kind of upset about all this because I see it every day. We vote uh, people in that say they're going to do one thing or any other. Then we find out after they go in, they don't even know what the constitution is. Mm -hmm. They don't even, they don't know how to follow it because they don't care about it. Mm -hmm. And there should be some way that when a, when a, when a government denies the constitution, that that's changed immediately. It should, they should be thrown out and mm -hmm. start again. What's that one uh, governor that said, the, it's above his pay grade. The mm -hmm. Constitution is above his pay grade. That's that was in New Jersey, Jersey, right? New Jersey. He said that on national news, right? Right. And, and so there should be a deal. Okay, you're not qualified to do the job. Monday morning, you have to be out. Because this is, is baloney. How, Rob, you know, throughout history, they gradually, they don't just come and take everything away. They gradually, so that they keep us numb, take our stuff away from us. This happened throughout history. And that's what we're seeing, all these things. Oh, it it's only affects a couple people, right? But then right. we're finding more and more. And, and so it's irritating to me because, you know, I'm going to vote tomorrow. Here and, in Arizona, it's our primary. Right, it's our primary. Okay. And I know there's some people out there that I personally know that are going to be good people, but there's others that I need to vote. They say they're going to do the right thing, but are they? Are they going to do the right thing? And if they don't, then what? I, I've followed your show. I almost feel like I've been at your kitchen table when you talk about this before. You'll get your family and friends together and have a discussion. Okay, what did you learn about this candidate? What do you feel about them? What else have you heard them say? What do other people say? I've um, stopped the conversation in a number of small gatherings. Someone will be there, my son, friends, and I go, wait a minute, you guys know more about the local sports team than you know about the people mm. you're going to elect. Mm. You don't even know the track record of the different candidates. And yet here you are comparing sports stats. Please do your homework because one's going to affect you for an afternoon on Sunday. One's going to affect you for years to come and maybe generations. Um, yeah, the converse, conversation stops. People look down, and but then they go, yeah, okay, that is our civic duty. That's what it means to be an informed voter. Mm, 
Amen. Amen to that. And, and you're right. We do what we can in our own sphere of influence, but that's the key. We have to do what we can. We can't just sit back and say, mm, you know, well, who's going to listen to me? And let, let me, here's a, a bar bet. I'm a refugee from California. The chairman of the Los Angeles County Republicans, and yes, there are Republicans in Los Angeles County. He said if he could get half of the registered Republicans to vote, mm. they would sweep the entire state for all statewide elections. The participation of voters is that low. That's what happened in Virginia. People stayed home. Uh, other people, largely by spending large, large amounts of money on media, got a few more percentage uh, voters to participate of one party or another. And now the other party looked, wait a minute, we stayed home. You go, yeah, it's a participation sport. You must be present to win. Well, a lot of people think that mm -hmm. my vote doesn't count. And a lot of people think that my vote is not accurate, that it, they, I don't trust the election system. Mm -hmm. So why should I get off my couch and go and vote? Now, I'm not agreeing with that 100%. You know, we need to vote. It's the only defense we have right now. Mm -hmm. But there are people that just think it's not, it's not worth it. Why? It's not going to make any difference. What's there's a sports phrase here somewhere. You'll 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 miss a hundred percent of the of all, all the shots you don't take. There you right. go. There right. you go. So right. uh, that's the extent of my sports knowledge. We will have to move off of that. Well, we need to, we need to tell the people that <laughs> follow sports more than they do politics yeah. that you sitting on the couch rooting them to win doesn't mean that doesn't help them win. Oh, that's true. It Screaming at the TV win. doesn't yeah. help apparently. A, a major news commenter put it this way. If everybody voted, you couldn't cheat. Mm. Right. You know, right. Um, or I think the other way he phrased it is if, if all of us vote, their attempts to cheat at the margin will hardly matter. And, and then you read about a local of, official on the East Coast who put in 230 votes, all for one candidate, uh, one polling official. He got caught. What was sad is that was a significant fraction of the votes for that office because we stayed home. Right. Man, and right. We got it wouldn't have made any difference if we'd have voted. Home. If we'd all voted, it wouldn't have made any difference. It, they can't cheat if we show up. Yeah. Absolutely. So another one of your articles uh, recently is, I, I mean, it should be screaming at us because uh, the watchwords right now seem to be racism is everywhere. It's, it's the watchword of the day and uh, bigotry. And your title here is the racism and bigotry that the left desperately wants to ignore. It was uh, published on July 17th of 2020 uh, at your Slow Facts blog site. And how, how can there be at right now, how can there be any racism that somebody isn't shining a light on? So you please shine a light on what you are, uh, your article's about. There are uh, topics that the news media um, refuses to look at. Take our deep blue cities, Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Boston, Baltimore, Trenton. If you would, were to go and apply for a firearms permit in those cities, you would be denied. M almost exclusively, you would be denied. But then if we, let's go back to LA, for example, if you look at who gets permits, they're connected politicians and major donors. If you, Cheryl, uh, as, a, uh, as a woman go to apply, it's 10,000 times more likely that you can get a permit anywhere else in the United States than you can get your permit to carry in Los Angeles. Now, I can't carry San Francisco or California, excuse me, won't recognize an out-of-state permit. I could apply, but I would be denied because I'm not a major political donor in that city. Same if you're a Hispanic in Los Angeles. And yet judges refuse to look at that blatant bigotry and say, whoa, how can this be? This is, this is as bad as any stereotype of a Southern town out of the 1950s, and yet it persists day after day. Oh, 
We just want to make sure that the individual getting a permit has good moral character. That's called may issue. The law enforcement officer has the chief law enforcement officer, typically the sheriff, sometimes the uh, appointed police chief, may or may not issue at his discretion, where the rest of the country is largely shall issue. As long as this person is not prohibited, then I am required, you shall issue the permit as the law states. Yeah, the that media like doesn't royal, want to see it. That sounds like royalty issues to me. The leader, the ruler of this country decides who can and who cannot have something. Right. That doesn't sound like political. Uh, it's, it's royalty. Uh, we were told we'd be safer if we can examine individual applicants. It turns out we're not safer and politicians sold our rights back to us and selected individuals were able to buy them. You know, that is so true. And, you know, you'll see an article once in a while that, you know, in certain places we are, Dan and I are blessed to live in Arizona, where I give full credit to the Arizona Citizens Defense League, the AZCDL, for keeping our our freedoms as in place as they are. And we still have room mm -hmm. to move that line back to freedom and, and to improve. But we'll read articles about places that say, well, you have to actually show to a judge somewhere, some subjective person, some permissive system, show a judge somewhere that you have a really good reason based on having already been, you know, assaulted or, you know, some horrible thing happening to your life, that you have a, have a really good reason to need and want to carry a firearm or even own one. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm breathing and I want <laughs> to continue breathing. That's my reason. How, how does it get any more complicated than that? You and I think that should be enough. And the tragedy is people actually come to those same judges, often magistrates in those districts. And they say, hey, I've got a stalker. I've taken out a restraining order. I've been threatened. He's violated the restraining order. Let me defend myself, at least in my home, please, as I go to and from. <clears throat> and sadly, we have numerous examples where those people die, are murdered, waiting for a government permission slip. So why don't we do mm. this? You want reasonable reasons, okay? How about just a clip of the news for the day? Mm. That should oh. be enough to show <laughs> yeah. why you need to be able to protect yourselves. Millions of people in Chicago. Millions and millions of people took your advice, Dan. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Every month. Well, and I think that, um, you know, that will beget more because somehow our nation went from pretty much every single home everywhere having at least one firearm because it was food on the table right? A way to right. get food on the table. And it was a way to preserve your life and the lives of your family, the lives of your livestock and all these things. So somehow we went from that to now it being like weird that people own guns. And, you know, there's this whole uh, fear driven uh, idea that, that guns are a, a strange thing to have in your home. So now We've got millions upon millions of brand new gun owners on top of the millions upon millions of already uh, pe people already owning guns. So I think that that value system and that culture, it has an opportunity to move forward if we will maybe just get out of our own way and, and not... Um, I don't even know how to how to put this in a nutshell, but Rob, you and I know, and Dan, we know that sometimes the gun community and Second Amendment advocates are our own worst enemies because we step on our own narrative or we want to reach out and constantly point at, well, that guy's not saying it right, and that guy is not holding his gun right, and that guy's not, you know. And so if you're one of those new people that walked into the new, you know, the family reunion. You're going, mm, right. I don't think I want to be part of this craziness. You know, when you guys get yourselves sorted out, then maybe I'll try again. But what do you have to say about all of that? The gun culture is enormously wide. It covers every socioeconomic background, every race, every region, every aspect of our culture has a firearms owning component. 
Now, here's the crazy thing. Concealed means concealed. Mm -hmm. The guy sitting next to you in church may be carrying. Mm -hmm. The guy sitting next to you in the restaurant, in the grocery store is probably carrying. Odds are there are certain, there are certain uh, blue islands where that's uh, rare. But for most of the United States, people are carrying. I, I was at a gathering recently and we went, Okay, uh, you know, I had some trouble doing this activity because I couldn't carry today. And the guy goes, well, this is how I managed it. And you're all, okay, we outed ourselves you know, uh, inadvertently. This culture is terribly wide. You know, if, if you find a place you're not welcome, leave there. There are others who will, who will welcome you with open arms. Uh, I'm sorry, your first try or maybe your third try out of one out of three wasn't uh, what we'd hope. Don't give up. We're here to help. Amen, Amen to that. All right. Um, which kind of we already we touched on, but you wrote an article titled "What Do You Do Now That You Bought Your Gun?" That was on July second, twenty twenty. What What did you cover in that particular article? We're 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 bumping up against the uh, running out of time, Cheryl. So I'm going to condense that. We have a movie perspective of what it means to be a gun fighter, which is very different than what civilians do. We're, we're defenders who happen to use a gun. You know what? My best defensive tool is a pair of sneakers. If I see a problem coming, I'm going to just back around the corner and go, ooh, not my circus, not my monkeys, unless, oh, but there's my neighbor who's at risk. Okay, now I'm, I'm not going to let them get robbed on the street. I have to stand up. I have to do what I can because I see other innocent life. That's the way most of us are born. We have this per perception that to be a defender means I'm fast with a gun. In fact, grandma wins because she cheats. <laughs> she hears the right she hears the back window break she doesn't want to get in a gunfight she hides in the back of her room hopefully she locks the door she has her gun she gets on her cell phone says help help 911 and somebody comes through her door she's trapped it's not an issue of who draws faster who aims faster who presses the trigger faster grandma is in an infinitely depend, defensible position where unless you've got a, a platoon of Marines coming through the door with explosives, grandma's gonna win time after time. So we have to, new gun owners have to learn how to cheat and survive. We don't want a fair fight. Right, and you know, you mentioned the, the first thing about being a new gun owner is being able to back away and leave before, uh, that is the most important thing. I watch. I used to watch YouTube videos quite a bit about this, and there are many times that people could have gotten away. They could have just Gone drove off, safety. and they ended up wanting to show they were tougher than the other person, uh, and it's terrible. And a gun doesn't give you power like that. It it gives you the power to protect yourself if you need to protect yourself, but you have to learn that. Hey, if I can get away, I want to get away first. If I can stop. You know, some of my friends from getting hurt, we're going to do that first. But if we can't, then we have the firearm to, to defend ourselves, right? You, you know how you can tell who owns a gun? He'll be the guy who's drinking a Coke or a soda at a bar with his friends. And one of his friends starts acting crazy and he goes, come on, we're leaving. Because he knows that if a fight breaks out, there's going to be a gun involved because he's carrying it. And he knows well, he has to do everything he can to avoid it. Rob, I'm going to do one better. You know how you can tell if a guy has a gun? You won't, unless he needs it. <laughs> unless he needs it, you won't. Unless he needs it. Yeah. That's because, you know, we were taught that if you pull the gun out, you better use it. You know, and so I, I hate that feeling. I hate saying that word, but if I pull my gun out, the next thing is to happen, I'm going to pull the trigger. Because if, if not, I'm, I'm not going to pull it out. If I right. don't need to pull it out, I'm not going to pull it out. So... It's, it's, it's terrible, but that's how I feel. Cheryl, do we have one minute for me to respond to that or should we pick oh, it up next yes, time? We do. No, no. absolutely. And okay. then I, I want to wrap up with one other article very quickly. So oh, go wow. ahead. Yeah. Um, I've had law enforcement officers who were very well trained uh, with a firearm. They, they competed nationally and they said, I was good enough that I knew the time I needed and I wasn't 
pressed yet. So I got to watch things unfold mm -hmm. because I knew I still had uh, something I could use to, to uh, secure my safety. New gun owners need to cheat so that they have the time they need and they need to know how much time they need. They learn yeah. that through practice. They learn that through training. Right. And that takes us again to that reactive versus proactive mindset, right. Right? right? So if you're proactive, you've got your training, you've already walked through a gajillion mental what if scenarios, right? And, and you, you, when you walk into a room, you've got kind of an assessment of what's going on and where your exits are and all that sort of thing. Um, so that is so good. I want you to just narrow in very quickly for people that are listening and they don't, they, maybe they don't understand that phrase. What do you mean by cheat? Now, it makes me think of uh, Jeff Cooper. I think it's Jeff Cooper who said, if you find yourself in a fair gunfight, right, then, right. then you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> There's the Hollywood Western meeting at high noon in the middle of town. The town, uh, townspeople s empty the street. We'd call that a fair fight. If someone breaks into my house, I don't want to be in a fair fight. I don't want to fight at all. I want to put a door between me and the bad guy with my family behind me because otherwise he can have the large screen TV. Hopefully the, piece, the police will get there in time to arrest him. Great. But until I and my family are threatened, it's not a gun problem. The gun is the wrong tool. And yet, if he does come through that door, it's not going to be a fair fight. Doors are called fatal funnels. So are hallways. In my podcast, uh, Self-Defense Gun Stories, a recent example, a guy late at night is playing video games downstairs. Three armed uh, 19 and 20-year-olds smash through his ground floor uh, doors and windows. Unfortunately, they poured down a hallway to get to the light where he was playing video games. Being in a hallway is a fatal funnel. One of them escaped alive. He didn't engage in a fair fight. I don't want new gun owners or experienced gun owners for that matter to engage in a contest of, of uh, will and speed. I want you to use the mental faculties to set yourself up so you can't lose and can, can protect the innocent people behind you. Right. I, I love that. It's kind of like the idea of flipping the script, you know, on, on how we might think uh, this is supposed to play out. And you were making me think of, uh, we've been watching the show Turn about the Revolutionary War. And wow. so you have all these red coats walking out in a line. You have all of these blue coats walking out in a line. And then they just shoot at each other. They stand there, no cover, no nothing. And it's just like, it's uh, crazy. How... How did anything ever actually get done other than just killing people, you know, on the battlefield when you're, you're engaging in that way? And so, yeah, they, they should have known Jeff Cooper and said, let's right. not have right. a fair gunfight. I kind of wonder, have an when, effective when, did they, when did they start battles where they actually hide under cover? And, and when did that change? I don't they know. did 1812 was the same battle. They just stood in front of each other and shot, right? Let's contrast the Napoleonic Wars, which were engagements between major, major military forces and the shot heard around the world. Mm -hmm. 15,000 irregular armed citizens chased the preeminent military force on the planet, the British Army that was in Boston and had moved into Lexington and Concord. And when they were done, these irregulars firing from cover sent the British scampering home. That military force never left Boston again by land. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know one case where it changed in. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's that one made, we can count. It makes all yeah. the difference. That's I like awesome. that. So, uh, you know, don't, don't fight fair. <laughs> fight effectively, but get training so that you know what you're doing and, the, and where the difference lies. Uh, last article I want to just touch on real quick before we run away. Um, it's titled Frightening Ourselves in the Age of Fear and Rage, uh, posted on July 15th of 2020. What, what does that mean exactly? What are we, how are we frightening ourselves? Wow, this is, 2020 should be known as the year of fear and rage. We saw COVID 
And that was sold to us as millions did. And we passed the peak back in mid-April. And it's still being, we have fear sold to us every night. Right behind it, we have Seattle, Portland, Chicago, Black Lives Matter, some of which has legitimate concerns, other of which is just power politics trying to manipulate us again and make us scared. So a new gun owner sees the violence in the inner city. We're looking at the world through a long distance microscope. We can't even tell how big the crowds are who are engaged in this violence. And yet it feels real. Well, okay, take a breath. If you want to make your family secure, you know, start with locking your doors, do the right thing. If you want to make your community secure, hey, have you even read about crime in your neighborhood? Do you know what happens? Um, our mutual friend, friend Ben Branham, um, a firearms instructor and Marine goes, when I was in the military, I had to read about after action reports. How are we doing? What works and doesn't? You know, if you walk into your local precinct and go, what are, what's going on in my neighborhood in the last six months? The sergeant behind the desk would be thrilled to tell you. So there's so many ways we should protect ourselves, but we have to take a breath, think about it, and do the first things first. Absolutely. Well, the way that I've seen this, uh, the information about COVID come together, and I do want to say that we're in the studio on Monday, July 3rd of 2020. And so, yes, COVID is still with us. Uh, uh, do you mean August? Oh, sorry. August 3rd. Thank you. Thank okay. you for correcting that. I, my brain is still in July because we just... I knew there was a time <laughs> shift between where I am and, not that and big. Phoenix, but it's not that big. <laughs> not that big. Um, but the way that I've seen the news about COVID happen it is exactly the way that it has been presented when there is a, a, a mass killing event uh, involving a firearm, right? So there's somebody that, that shoots several people in a mall or a school or something like that. But there is this, uh, this funneling of information and this focusing to this, the point that it feels like it's permeating everything, everywhere and something has to be done. And so if you do kind of take, you know, the 30,000 foot view, take a step back and really look at it. No, it isn't. We aren't, you know, having this situation, whatever, fill in the blank. It was, uh, you know, trying to paint guns as evil and gun owners as evil. Now it's trying to paint, you know, if you're uh, not in full lockstep with, you know, shutting down your business that maybe your family has, you know, uh, put together for generations upon generations. If you're not okay with it, um, just mindlessly repeating what you heard on the latest air quote news report, right? that, that there's something other about you, there's something wrong about you, because don't you understand the, the, the impact of this illness, you know, uh, I really think there's a similarity in that. Funnel, well, sheep, but they want us to be sheep. They do. Go ahead, well, Rob. Watch what the news isn't telling us. They didn't compare this epidemic to SARS that we had, mm. right. what, uh, eight years ago? Mm. They didn't say, by the way, here's the current mortality rate in the United States. Here it is compared to Sweden, mm -hmm. who never went for a lockdown. They said, this is the flu, we're marching on. By the way, just as if it were a new strain of the flu, grandma, stay home for a little bit. Yeah. Let's let, right. they took their strongest segment of po the population, young students, and said, go out in the world. By the way, I know this sounds bad. You're going to have the sniffles for a weekend. If, if the strongest segment of our population becomes ill, they then become immune. Mm -hmm. Almost none of, almost no kids no healthy kids die of COVID, which mm -hmm. is great news. But now all of a sudden, they can't later carry it to grandma. And Sweden's death rate, who never had any lockdowns or quarantine, is now lower than ours. That's what the news doesn't tell you because they're busy selling soap. We're mm -hmm. being, in, we're being, um, what's the word, tantalized, incited mm -hmm. rather than informed. You're we're right. being we're being herded to to stay in one group. We're just we're all supposed to think the same way. 
We're all supposed to be in fear. That way, you know, you can control fear. The government can control fear. Or the people can control fear. Right. Um, I don't understand it, Rob. I mean, out of all the years, you would think that 2020 would be something we'd have saw coming. <laughs> right? Well, we, okay, let's think back. In, in some sense, we did. The, the prototype for 2020, remember the science fiction, for, science fiction story, War of the Worlds? Yep. Where somebody read a radio play and people thought it was real. Right. Oh, man. Right? Now, now, later we saw, uh, we saw Godzilla destroy Tokyo and we said, I'm not, no, that's not quite real. But now we're given fake statistics. Do you know how many cases of COVID there are, Dan? Well, yeah, we're now testing everybody. So they are cases. They're not fatalities. Right. right. In my area, right. I have seen. Bingo. You're right. In my area, um, other than the la in last three weeks, before that time, I could go to work every day and see nothing. But now they have COVID testing everywhere. So what does that mean All to right. me is they want to get the numbers up. They want to show more people well, have whether it. Whether they want to, whether that's the motivation or not, the fact is that we do have more data, but they're using right. that more data As to sound like, oh my gosh, right. it's like you, what's, it, what's fascinating to me is, do you know when we tested the population, about three quarters of them had COVID in the past and you go, cool, the epidemic's done. Yeah. Can't, can't reproduce anymore. Too many of us have had it. There aren't enough uh, potential uh, patients that it can pick up. I, I like looking at the, I, boy, that, I need a new word there, Cheryl. I'm informed when I look at the, the rates of illness and see them falling and falling and falling. Absolutely. And, and we've got this idea early on that if you are diagnosed with COVID, that it is a death sentence. And it's like we've sort of emotionally stayed stuck there so that our yeah. brains can't engage and go, well, no, if we, you know, if we catch it, unless we have some comorbidities or we're of a certain right. age and all those things, then it's not necessarily a death sentence. And, you know, we get a daily alert on my phone from one of the local news stations in air quotes telling us how many new cases and how many new deaths. And they always put the new cases number at the top at right. first. So you see that and you go, oh, 3,000, 3,000 people have COVID. And then you read down a little bit and it goes, and 14 new deaths. Now, every family that's experiencing one of those deaths, it, that's, that's paramount. That's everything. That's someone's mom, that's someone's grandma, that's, you know, we're not minimizing that. We're just saying, let's keep a perspective about whether, you know, catching it sometimes means you don't even know. Right. Usually. Yeah. You, you're, it's so horrible. You don't even know, you, know you have right. it. And instead of telling us how many deaths in Arizona, right? Why don't you tell us that you know, seven million, so hundred, many hundred thousands of people didn't die from COVID right. today D and right. didn't test positive for COVID today. That would be a completely different conversation with the exact same information, right? Uh, you know, I think I'll change the channel and see what the new sports score is. That's the fear. That's why they have to sell fear. Now, think of it. You're, and you're right. 2020, Dan, we should have seen it coming. We have a dying legacy media who has turned itself, I mean, major news organizations have turned themselves into the National Enquirer because they're afraid we'll turn them off. It's worse than National Enquirer. National Enquirer, you saw it and said, no, that's not true. <laughs> Half the people believe the news. I, I tell you, Rob, I feel much better. About a month ago, the only thing I use Facebook for now is I'll look at a couple of captures of friends, but mainly, mainly for the marketplace to buy things. Okay. I don't use Facebook. I very briefly watch the news. I feel better about myself. I feel better about everything. I do know there's stuff lingering out there. I do know the world has problems, but I am not faced with every morning going, oh God, I hope I don't get COVID today. I hope that, you know, I'm not, it's, I, I, I let it out of my mind and I feel much better. And that's part of it too. If you feel that you're going to get something, you're going to get it, mm. you know? We have to we have to fight this thing and we have to be strong. So I'm not I'm not watching the news. I, I saw a beautiful cartoon. It said, "Dan Cheryl, 
the end is near, COVID's here, only 996 of us out of a thousand will survive. You know? <laughs> right. right. Yeah, better get the lifeboats. We need really, really, really it's, tiny it, lifeboats. But it's it, a really we need tiny some. lifeboat. Yeah. Here, I mean, you have a on. life jacket. You know, <laughs> you, 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 you listen to this stuff and then you wake up in the morning and you got a little sore throat. Well, it's because there's a fire down the road and there's fire uh, smoke in the air. And you go, oh my God, do I have COVID? Oh, I, I, I better not. Oh my gosh. And you, you worry about that. And then the next day you wake up and your nose may be a little runny because you had hot peppers last night <laughs> or whatever. And you start thinking, Oh, I bet I got the COVID. And it's like, no, we, you, I have allergies. I have these effects. Right. My, my wife was recently in Africa. Our virtue signaling to show how much we care about our fellow uh, citizens in the United States we can afford a lockdown. A lot of us can. Now, a lot of us can't. And you know this because you advocate for financial responsibility. A majority of American adults don't have a month's expenses saved up. Right. There are places, what, what was it? Uh, a billion people in the world don't have uh, consistent electricity. They can't save food for uh, a week. They go out every day to get water and food and fuel for their family. A lockdown is a death sentence. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're yeah. killing tens of thousands of children a month. It's absolutely, yeah. it's terrible. Yeah. All right. Well, we do have to run. Rob, thank you so much for all that you do, uh, the, the work that you put into these articles and the ideas that you, you know, give us some a new way to view things and chew on it mentally that's so important uh pulls us out of that that lockstep mindset that the rest of the news and air quote wants to to put us in so we appreciate you thank you both for all you do thank you, thank you all right thank rob you. morse of slow facts blog and the polite society podcast have a great day rob see Take ya care. bye 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 rob you know <clears throat> just i get angry when i see well all of these... i think maybe you need to be angry i mean need to be i think it's it's a healthy reaction to be angry at the garbage what was that out I, there okay so sometimes i get so angry that i block things out and i forget about them mm. what the, what it, was i so upset about a judge yesterday what did he rule do you remember that one <laughs> there's it, so many i know but this judge ruled something it was beyond ridiculous and I can't remember what it is. And I probably shouldn't have mentioned it because now I don't remember. But it was so ridiculous. I had to block it completely out of my mind. Yeah. It was, no, it's the a ACLU. The ACLU was saying that you can no longer film protests. Oh, right. Or something like that. The, the, or the no, police it, can't it was this. The police or... in Portland, the police are not allowed to film the protesters. Mm-hmm. That's what that was. infringement on their civil rights. Now, but wait. So we go back and we say back when the ACLU or whatever said that we have a right to film the police when they're arresting yeah. and you can't stop us because this is public land yeah. and you can't stop us. And now they're turning around and saying that the police can't film us basically protesting and, and rioting and a judge ruled in their favor. In Portland. Well, I don't know how they're going to do it. How is that? I don't know. But what are you going to do with all of the, um, you know, citizen journalists? What are you going to do with all of the uh, cameras that are on buildings, you know, for security camera footage, right. all that kind of stuff? It, I think it's, they can say it. But is there really any, any teeth to it? But we, we really have to, to blast out of here. We will probably talk about that some more because it is one of those things we should dig into mentally and go, what? How does that even make what, sense? What, 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 what? So, all right. Thank you to our amazing listeners. We love you. We value you. Your time is your most finite commodity. And when you spend it with us, whether you're watching the videos on YouTube or on GunStreamer or on OpsLens, or whether you're uh, listening to our audio only on our website, you know, we value you. Thank you for that. And then taking these conversations into your world and your sphere of influence. Uh, if you want to, track all of the interviews we've ever had go to gunfreedomradio.com click on the on demand tab and 
binge listen to your heart's content with Danny mocking me. Uh, and then you can click on the guest tab and see bios and photos and, and um, links to the works of all the guests that we've ever had on in all of our 236 as of today episodes. It's a great resource and we don't hate it when you spend time there. Nope. Thank you to our amazing guest today, Rob Morris. He's a good friend. He does good work and uh, he, he writes some amazing articles that, that really want to make you think. So uh, spend some time on, on his uh, pages, his, uh, the work that he does. And until next time, pray for our nation. Yes. Pray for our leaders. Most of them representatives, <clears throat> whatever you them. want to call them, all of them, Dan, even the ones you don't like, especially the ones you don't like. Okay. So okay. It's a challenge for me too. I am talking to my own self right now. Couldn't we just send them somewhere? No. Can we just like give them No, a, we could invite them to, to go someplace country? they might be happier. We could no. do that. <laughs> You know, like you hate it here so much, there's an entire planet out there. I bet there's a place you would be happier. Yeah. Right? Anyway, be good to each other. Have a great week and God bless. Bye bye.